Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our very first panel for the current strategy forum. I am the panel moderator, and each of our esteemed panelists will speak for between 15 to 20 minutes. This will be followed by Q&A from the audience, so I do encourage you to ask some good, hard-hitting questions. Uh, the full biographies of each panelist are given in the program, so I will not read them extensively. I will just go over the intros very quickly. And then um, the intros, after the intros, I will start with uh, Dr. Patrick Cronin, and then that's followed by Dr. Bernard Haeckel, and then that's followed by Dr. Nick Gosda. So Dr. Cronin is Senior Advisor and Senior Director of the Asia Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Dr. Haeckel is a historian of the Arab Arabian Peninsula and a scholar of Islamic law and Islamic political movements. He's also a professor of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. And Dr. Gazdev is a professor of National Security Affairs here at the Naval War College. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Cronin. Professor Alvey, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be back here at the current Strategy Forum and at the Naval War College, the seat of strategic thinking that I think Andrew Krepinevich rightly ended his excellent morning keynote speech on by saying that if we're not thinking about innovative strategy for the long term here, then it's not going on in the United States. Um, we face an increasingly contested world, and I think you'll find my comments largely uh, consistent, if uh, more detailed, on Asia than the ones made by Dr. Krepinevich. Uh, we recognize, even those of us who are focused so heavily on the Indo-Pacific these days, that this is a global set of challenges. And so Desh, for instance, in finding a sustainable counterterrorism strategy for the United States is no doubt the most urgent security challenge that the United States faces right now. We recognize that. But the urgent must not crowd out the important. Because if you start to look at the long-term trends, and we're going to get a great glimpse into the future when Matt Burroughs speaks after lunch, when you start to think about that half of the population that lives in that circle from India and China to Southeast Asia, and how that's going to grow technologically, and how the innovation pace will pick up. The disruptive technologies, the resource competition, the economic competition, that's where it grows so much over the next 15 to 30 years that the past 15 to 30 years is not necessarily the best barometer. And the world changes potentially fundamentally. And if the world is splintering and fragmenting, and is changing from the bottom up as well as the top down in terms of state competition and competition within states, this is the most dynamic region in the world. And so for the long term, we better have a strategy focused on it. And that's why I'm so concerned about the increasing contestation in Maritime Asia. And that's really what I want to talk about. In Maritime Asia, just to take the last seven years, the contest has heated up yet once again both especially in the East China Sea and in the South China Sea. In the East China Sea, of course, we have one key ally in Japan that is focused like a laser beam on the problem of the Northwest Island chain, uh, the Ryoku Islands. And that's indeed, as again, Andrew Krepinevich alluded at the very end in his last answer to a question about the five bases that Japan's building up. There's very little attention being paid to the base buildup, both in China and in Japan. And so I just came back from Ishigaki. Ishigaki is actually the island that is responsible nominally for the security of the Senkaku, or the Dayutai, as the Chinese call them. Um, and they're the ones that are beefing up the Coast Guard presence next to Yanaguni Island, where there's a ground uh, radar, uh, where Miyako Island, uh, uh, Shimoji Island, other buildups potentially for aircraft, um, and the Chinese now have announced a new Coast Guard base uh, right on the, on the mainland of China opposite um, in the northern part of Taiwan, and they're building up islands as well. There's a slow buildup going on, even though we're in a bit of a checkmate given the tensions that we've seen in the East China Sea since about 2008. So let me just quickly do the chronology of the last seven years in the East China Sea on the maritime issue. Japan and China sign a historic agreement to 
explorer for energy in the East China Sea in the summer of 2008. Things are looking up. Things are looking positive. Old adversaries may be bearing the hatchet and thinking about cooperation for all, win-win situations. Six months later, the Chinese conduct a operation to essentially challenge Japan's administrative control over those islands. Um, and they send in the first of what is going to be a, a regular steady stream of flotillas, both naval and law enforcement, Coast Guard and other maritime law enforcement vessels, as well as inviting and encouraging fishermen and their so-called maritime militias to constantly and vigilantly contest the areas around those islands. So what has been in Japan's hands ever since the United States reverted Okinawa Prefecture and the Senkakus back to Japan after we had occupied them, after Japan was vanquished, we only reverted them back in 72. They've been uncontested in terms of Japanese administrative control. Now they're an administration contestation by the Chinese and a contest that the Japanese don't want to, to, to acknowledge. The, you'll remember the Chinese drunken Coast Guard or, or fishing trawler captain ramming not one but two Japanese Coast Guard ships. Um, that led to his incarceration very briefly before the Chinese used coercive diplomacy and on the Japanese government, the, the then opposition government of the Democratic Party of Japan to essentially release the captain right away. And um, that in turn led to domestic pressures in Japan to nationalize three of the five Senkaku Islands in 2012 which really ticked off the Chinese, and that's what led to uh, up-tempo in the patrols both in and through the territorial waters and airspace over those contested islands. Uh, and that, in turn, led to pressure on Japan's ally to reassure Japan and to deter China about assertiveness that could get out of control, especially when the Chinese had instances of locking on a fire control radar, harassing uh, aircraft, patrol aircraft with uh, uh, with, with fighter jets that could lead to something like the EP-3 incident, uh, a lethal incident back in 2001 with the United States. In the United States, and did re in reassure Japan, the president himself in Japan, uh, about Article 5 of the Security Treaty with Japan, did apply to territories administered by Japan, and that includes the Senkaku or Dayutai. So that's where we are. The good news is that the United States reaffirmation of the alliance, Japan's steady buildup and serious approach of the Abe administration has made the cost of action by China fairly high. So China has created a new status quo in the sense that they now can claim internationally and domestically that they have also uh, a stake at claiming those islands more administrative control because they keep intruding in the waters occasionally. But at the same time, the situation is that slow buildup, but no interaction of note lately. That could change in an instance, of course, with an instance, an incident, but right now it's steady. The South China Sea has been different because the South China Sea, there's been open running room for China. There is no U.S.-Japan alliance. <clears throat> the U.S.-Philippine alliance is a relatively weak new alliance in the sense that this is not the Cold War uh, or even uh, post-Spanish-American War uh, relationship with the Philippines. This is a much more equal relationship that's been built up, driven out of Manila in terms of uh, especially President Aquino's concern about uh, Chinese assertiveness. Assertiveness that flared up especially in the spring of 2012 over Scarborough Shoal, a uh, shoal that's closer, it's within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. China claims it. Um, it escalated. The United States successfully walked back our ally, the Philippines, to draw down. China basically took over Scarborough Shoal, and they essentially have uh, effective operational control over Scarborough Shoal today. What they're doing now with the reclamation, the land building, the military base building, the forward staging, uh, st staging bases that they're creating, they're, by building Fiery Cross Reef up into a major runway, and Mischief Reef, which you remember from the 90s with the Philippines, they're building up these into full-scale potential staging bases that can take aircraft as well as ships, troops, um, and they will move down the effective line of control of China, of the PLA, 140 miles south from where they effectively were operating before, because we're talking about moving from 12 degrees north latitude to under 
uh, 10 degrees north latitude in those two bases. Now, yes, they're vulnerable bases in a lot of ways, but China is salami slicing bit by bit, and they're moving ahead incrementally. This is one incremental strategy that may actually work. Uh, unlike our incremental strategies, which seem to be destined to fail, uh, this is an incremental strategy that has been called an exquisite strategy. And here I would submit that an exquisite strategy can defeat exquisite technology. And that's one of the challenges that we face right now. So let me just talk about, Carl Thayer is gonna be on the program later and he's a great expert on the South China Sea and I know he'll have a lot to say and I'm happy to talk in detail in Q&A if there's time. Um, but let me move on with the fact that there's a strategic gap here going on between China and the United States and the rest of the region as well. It's not just about these tactical operations that have flared up in the last seven years. China has long sought control and long claimed control over the South China Sea. So the 11 dash line map or the nine dash line map is not a new claim, but what has changed fundamentally of course is China's ability to do something about it. And it has become increasingly active as it's become more capable. So we've seen um, across the entire perimeter of China, its periphery diplomacy, if you will, both on the mainland and in the maritime domain, China playing a, a role to gain greater influence, control, and you call it Finlandization. I think that's, uh, there's, uh, there's no other term that quite aptly describes it, even though it's a European Cold War concept. Uh, it is the control and influence over the neighborhood. And that is indeed part of the Chinese strategy. It may be an entirely benign strategy from the Chinese perspective, right? They can arguably justify this is a defensive strategy. They've suffered in history. They had more than a century of humiliation. Uh, they're reclaiming their place. The problem is that it doesn't necessarily recognize the sovereignty of neighbors. It doesn't treat 21st century sovereignty within the rule set that we would recognize, rules that we've helped to build since the end of World War II. And that's a challenge. So we have to draw the line between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable behavior. The Chinese are seeking position. They're playing Wei Qi. So when Bob Work, under Secretary, Deputy Secretary Work, my former boss, you know, talks about the United States needs to play free chess. And the problem with that, um, and again, it's my friend James Holmes, Professor Holmes, wonderful, wonderful strategic thinker on maritime issues at a conference we were at last week, channeling Carl von Clausewitz was saying there are only two really important things in warfare, concentration and maneuver. Well, that may be true, but the key phrase there is in warfare. It assumes a military, military engagement. If you're not actually trying to get to the military to military engagement, now the playing field is much bigger. And that's really the challenge that the nation and the region face. They face a much larger comprehensive strategic positioning game that's going on in the long term. So interdependence continues to deter conflict, so does nuclear weapons, by the way. But while China may not be superior to American military might, they're now arguably superior to every other nation's military in the region, or soon will be if they're not. That is a big strategic challenge. So the United States has to wake up and, and with the rebalance to Asia Pacific, not at the expense of other regions, but in a way that recognizes that our long-term challenges and interests are going to grow. The competition and contest in Asia Pacific and the Indo-Pacific will grow. So we have to be engaged, we have to be present, we have to be strong if we're going to cooperate effectively and adapt. Engaging China is a huge part of this aspect. There was a question in the last, in the first session here this morning about uh, trying to look for Chinese cooperation. Certainly we should, wherever our interests converge, build on that cooperation. But as a, a, a great, uh, an excellent China analyst, Tom Christensen, in his new book, The China Challenge, uh, has written, the most difficult challenge we may face with China in this century is trying to convince China to contribute to the global order on the lines of what we would like. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, especially where there are convergent interests. But we should not fool ourselves, not delude ourselves into thinking that they're going to change their strategy. So when we possess, when we have sanctions, for instance, on PLA officers for hacking into the US websites, we shouldn't think that those sanctions are going to change Chinese behavior. The aim, the main aim, I would argue, of those sanctions, of the cost imposition, if you will, is to mobilize the region or the world against bad behavior 
and around the rules that we want. And meanwhile, we better be investing in our strength. We better be investing in our allies. We better be building partnership capacity building, including creating a common operating picture. The Chinese are objecting to a common operating picture and situational awareness in the South and East China Seas. If the Chinese do not accept shared information, the free flow of information with our allies and partners, then they will not accept any partnership capacity building. That's a red line. That's a line that we better be testing because we need to know that right now um, because we think China should be part of that common operating picture, by the way. This information ought to flow more readily so that people can be aware of what's happening. But we need to go beyond that, and I can talk more about that in the Q&A. I think I'm running up against the time. I know that one line here that Professor Wang Jiu Sir, who's an old, uh, an old friend, as the Chinese would say, um, and a top American watcher at uh, Peking University advises uh, many governments. He's sometimes credited with building this uh, new concept of a silk belt and road, uh, the idea of a major investment in development and trade uh, set of relations from China to uh, its region and beyond. You know, he quotes uh, Mencius, the, the famous Chinese philosopher, uh, to say that a state without an enemy or external peril uh, is absolutely doomed. And there's no doubt that the Chinese uh, need, in their very trying period of so many domestic challenges, uh, an external peril. So I don't want to exaggerate the extent to which China is spoiling for a fight, but China will take a bargain. China will seize an opportunity. China will go and use nationalism to compensate for declining legitimacy of the Communist Party and its potential for providing the economic wherewithal and wheel that it did before that provided so much legitimacy in the early decades. That's no longer the case as the, the rate of growth of the Chinese economy slows down. And as we look out, not just the next decade, but beyond, India looms much brighter as an economy in this, in this future. So bu building India into the Indo-Pacific is hugely strategic. That's why the new strategic technology relationship with India right now, even though it's marginal. I mean, we're, we're doing two small little Pathfinder projects. That's just a, the demonstration projects. In 20 years' time, we can be turning into serious carrier air, carrier maritime, other types of military technology. Same thing with Vietnam. That's why it was so important for Secretary of Defense Carter to visit those two countries, Vietnam and India, after the Shangri-La Dialogue this year, because he's signaling that we've got a long game as well. It taps into the third offset strategy or strategies, uh, that, again, Andrew Kepanevich alluded to, that's the long-term game. But in the short term, we have to be there every day engaging and shaping the rules, calling out bad behavior, imposing costs, even if they're mostly diplomatic and legal, and occasionally um, uh, running freedom of navigation operations and freedom of air operations. So I think I've gone on too long, Professor Alvey, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Dr. Haeckel. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, introduction, and I'm honored to be here my first time. So my task is to talk to you about the Middle East, and I uh, chose to use some slides, mostly for show and tell. But let me first begin by some of the distinguishing features uh, of the Middle East. First, you have, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. So we have persistent authoritarianism, which is you know, the form of political uh, culture and the types of states that we have in the Middle East. Uh, this is characterized also by bad governance and corruption and rapacious behavior by the elites there. Um, who brutalize their populations. Um, the societies are highly fragmented, and there are persistent cleavages. Cleavages are divisions within societies. These can be sectarian religious cleavages. They can be tribal cleavages or ethnic cleavages. Um, you have forms of crony capitalism and clientelism. Basically, these states don't function like anything we would recognize as normal states. Uh, but they are survival machines, and I often tell my students that they should think of the Terminator when thinking about these elites and these states because they are very good at uh, surviving 
and, and, and fighting even their own societies in order to do so. Uh, you also have in this, regions, the, in this region of the world the prevalence, pre prevalence of militant ideologies uh, and non-state actors. So these are ISIL or Daesh, um, Al-Qaeda, and other types of militant groups. Um, and these groups are often engaged in sectarian warfare, sectarianism, and proxy wars. The regional states are also engaged in using sectarianism against uh, each other. They use third parties uh, in, in wars. And this is what we're seeing in Syria and in Iraq uh, today. It's also a resource-rich country, uh, a resource-rich region that's geostrategically central to us and to the world. And you have, finally, a demographic explosion where something like 60 to 70 percent of the population is under the age of 30. Um, there are also other distinguishing features. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it is something to uh, keep in mind. These are facts that you should keep in mind uh, when thinking of this region. And it's also a place where a number of states are now fragmenting and you have political vacuum that's being filled in by these non-state actors. Uh, one final point also on the features, which I don't have up here, is that the internet and the information revolution has deeply penetrated this region so that in countries like Saudi Arabia, for example, a, pop, a native population of about 22 to 24 million, 11 million people are on Twitter. That means that virtually every person who's neither too young nor too old is on Twitter. And it, it has the highest consumption of YouTube videos per capita anywhere in the world. So this is a connected pop, uh, region of the world where people know a lot about what's happening beyond the region, but also are constantly trading all kinds of conspiracy theories and, and, and information true and false uh, amongst each other. And the state has lost the monopoly on uh, providing information and supplying information to the, uh, to the population. So let me just show you a, a map of the world. This is a map that I often use with my students. This is a map that shows countries. The size of a country is in proportion to the conven proven conventional reserves of oil in the ground. So you can see that uh, this region uh, around the Persian Gulf, or the, what the Arabs prefer to call the Arabian Gulf, has between Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, Iraq, and Iran, has something like 60 to 65 percent of the proven conventional reserves of oil in the world. It, and, and it dwarfs Russia, it dwarfs North America. This map does not take unconventional reserves like shale into account. But this is an important map uh, for you to think about uh, when you think about, uh, about the strategy and when you think about control of uh, hydrocarbon resources. This is, the, this is a map of the maritime routes and shipping and you can see the Admiral has already spoken to us about one of the, one of the choke points which is the Strait of Hormuz where you have about 15 and a half million barrels of oil uh, passing through that strait every day. Uh, but you also have Bab al-Mandeb between Yemen and the Horn of Africa. You have the Suez Canal. So the, you have three major uh, choke points just uh, in and around Arabia. And then north into the Mediterranean, you, of course, have the, another one in the Bosphorus in Turkey. Uh, so this, you know, making sure that these shipping lanes and these choke points are not blocked is a hugely important strategic interest. It's one that we inherited in this region from the British, and it's a cost that we choose to bear. And much of the oil, again, as the Admiral said, much of the oil that leaves the Strait of Hormuz actually doesn't come to the United States, but rather goes to the Far East. Nonetheless, oil is a global and fungible commodity. It's like, think of it as one big bathtub. If there's less of it in any one part of the world, there's less of it everywhere, and prices would spike if ever the oil could not pass through that, uh, through that choke point. It would make the recession of 2007, 2008 a small picnic were this oil to be blocked. We would, our, the entire global economy would tank uh, uh, because of it. Next, I want to show you a series of, qu very quickly, a series of slides of what the popula population pyramid of many countries in the Middle East looks like. And you can see that the base of the pyramid, these are pyramids 
where you see that the younger population are, are towards the bottom, and you can see that the bulk of the population is at the very uh, is towards the bottom, and that's when you have 60 or 70 percent of the population uh, extremely young. These are very uh, dynamic people who are frustrated because they can't get jobs. They can't get jobs means that they can't get married. They can't rent apartments. They can't buy. Um, so incredible personal frustration, which often leads to radicalization. This is the population pyramid of Egypt, you know, a very similar pattern. Population pyramid of Libya, again, a very similar pattern with the bulk of the people at the base. This is Yemen, which is a kind of a catastrophic uh, situation. It's, it is a failed state today, um, and you can see uh, sort of demographically why that, why that would be the case. And the one country that's most hopeful after the Arab Spring uprisings is Tunisia. And here you can see that the population pyramid looks somewhat different from the others. You have uh, the younger population at the base are actually is, are getting smaller. So you have, a, you have a, an economy that is that, that, that where the, most of the working population is towards the middle rather than at the base. And that, I think, explains in part why Tunisia has probably has done better than most of the other Arab Spring um, uprising nations. Now, I want to switch to militant Islamism. This is what uh, our government calls uh, extreme, uh, violent extremists. Um, th these are uh, groups that use Islam as a political ideology to argue for direct action or for militant action, uh, typically against their own states but also globally against the United States. So some of the features of militant Islamism is that they focus on purifying, on wanting to purify Muslim communities. They argue that Muslims, most Muslims, or the vast, even the vast majority of Muslims, don't have Islam, don't understand Islam correctly. Their views need to be changed, need to be purified, because most Muslims have taken on ideas that are not intrinsic or inherent to the religion. So these are purification movements you can think of them as, as Puritans. Uh, they also argue that if you follow their teachings, you can return to an idealized past, which is the first, roughly the first three centuries of Islam. Uh, they want to recover the lost power of this early period. They have global ambitions in reach, typically using asymmetrical forms of warfare. Uh, their signature uh, tactic is the suicide bombing. Um, but their, their principal focus is to destroy the local regimes in the Middle East. These are regimes that they call apostate regimes. So these are regimes that have abandoned Islam, uh, have become heretics. And they want to reform Muslim society. And you can think of Islamism as a culture. It's not just a political ideology or, or a set of tactics. It's not also a, uh, a, a, a mindset that is uh, concerned exclusively with violence or sadism as we would often think of them when looking at the beheading videos that they put out. But rather, it's a, it's a culture. And this culture is one that uses poetry, that uses uh, history, uh, that talks about, uh, about a new kind, fashioning a new kind of Muslim. And unless we think of them as a culture, uh, I don't think we can fully understand their appeal and their durability and endurance as a, as a political uh, movement. Um, so now, this is what the Islamic w world looks like today. You can see there are national b borders everywhere. This is the Westphalian system of nation states that is basically a product of Western history and Western concepts. And it is anathema to, is to the militant Islamists that this should be the case. They want to erase these borders. They think of these borders as uh, symbolizing the weakness and division, uh, the weakness of Muslims and the division of the Muslim community and that this is a deliberate ploy and policy of the West, what they want to do instead is to recreate something like this. This is what the Arab empire looked like in the 730s of the Christian era. It is an empire that spanned about 5,000 miles. Nothing, no empire had ever been created, had been created before then, nor since of this, of this size. And if you look at the map of the Islamic State, you can see that it wants to recreate, recreate that earlier empire and then add on more to it, any territory that had ever been uh, conquered by Muslims. Uh, so that's where Europe, for instance, comes in in the Balkans and 
and in Greece. So this is, a, this, is, this is the culture that I am talking about, and this is the imagined geography of these militant Islamists. Um, now, this culture is produced through largely and exists largely on the web, on the internet. And they have, they have uh, websites, this is one of them, uh, in which they, you can hear chanting of anthems, you can read um, uh, manifestos, documents, articles, uh, all kinds of debates. Um, it's a very lively culture. This is yet another of the websites. This is the one that's mostly used by the ISIL or by Daesh. And you can see that bin Laden up here in the top, uh, uh, in the top right corner, or your top left, your top uh, right corner, is still a major figure for them uh, in, the, in this movement. Um, and then I will end uh, on this uh, slide. So wh what should U.S. policy be? And these are just uh, um, my, my recommendations, and they're, they're, they're not half-baked, but they're, uh, they're, they're, they're certainly, uh, to, I think, to be considered, but you know, also elab elaborated on. So first, I think what the U.S. needs to do, and the West more generally, is to unambiguously delineate what our strategic, core strategic interests are uh, in this part of the world. A part of the world that is extremely volatile, highly fragmented, out of control. Partly we have contributed to this, to this phenomenon, but not exclusively. There are also indigenous and domestic reasons for this, for this situation. So I think our strategic interest should be to secure maritime commerce and, and shipping lanes, to prevent interstate warfare, we would not want Iran and Saudi Arabia to start fighting one another. Uh, to protect the oil and gas reserves, because 65% of them, are, especially the oil conventional reserves, are in this region. And then to defend allies, to draw red lines, where we make it very clear that countries like Jordan, Israel, Turkey, the Kurdish state, or the Kurdish semi-state up in northern uh, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia and the GCC countries, those are, those are red line countries for us that we would not allow the regimes there uh, to topple, we would not allow invasions to happen, and we would defend them the way we would defend South Korea uh, today. And to protect these interests unequivocally and make it very clear that we would do so, but also to encourage local actors to fight militant Islamism, not to take on the fight ex ourselves alone, because that is not a fight that we can win. And finally, to think of militant Islamism as something that can be contained uh, to the Middle East uh, as much as possible, and if possible, to contain it in the western deserts of Iraq and the eastern deserts of Syria, and uh, let the local regional powers deal, deal with it rather than uh, have to deal with it ourselves. Uh, because I don't think this is a movement that can be uh, defeated by outsiders. It has to be defeated by locals. Um, and on that note, I thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Gozdev. Thank you. Well, I'll bring the uh, focus now to Europe and Eurasia, and as you'll hear in my own remarks, some of the themes which my panelists have brought up will also apply there. I had the uh, privilege of accompanying Ambassador John Cloud on a study trip uh, to Europe this past month. Uh, Ambassador Cloud holds the William Ruger Endowed Chair here for Defense Economics at the War College. Uh, and we wanted to travel uh, to Europe uh, and to visit uh, a number of countries and to see and assess the impact of the events in Ukraine over the last year on uh, their approaches towards uh, defense spending, on the types of aid that they're willing to provide to Ukraine, and then larger issues related to Euro-Atlantic security. And so we had an opportunity to travel to Lithuania, to Poland, to Germany, and then to Belgium, uh, to Brussels, to uh, the European institutions. Uh, and we had an opportunity to meet with uh, current and former government officials, both in their national governments and also at the European level, members of the European Parliament, people who work in the European Commission, uh, people associated with the European Council, 
uh, analysts, academics, members of the business community. Uh, we traveled uh, as academics. We didn't travel as representatives of the, uh, of the U.S. government, although in some of our meetings uh, we did have uh, embassy people there as note takers to transmit what they thought might be of interest back to, uh, back to the State Department. What I'm going to do here is to give you some of my impressions. These are my own personal impressions uh, based on who we spoke with and, and some of the overall uh, feedback that we received uh, on this trip. And the first, of course, is that Europe is back in play, uh, that uh, the hope that Europe was settled, that we could focus on other parts of the world and, and Europe would take care of itself and that it would not simply perhaps be a security consumer, but it would be a security provider for other parts of the world. All of those assumptions are now challenged by the events which have been occurring over the last several years. Uh, one of the points that was reiterated to us at several, in several of the countries we visited is that Europe is faced with simultaneous crises. Uh, and that it, at several points people said that the crisis in Ukraine and the crisis in Greece are linked together, that these are linked events, not that they're being caused by uh, the same uh, actors, but that they reflect a similar problem. And that is, is that the Euro-Atlantic world expanded in the 1990s and the early 2000s with a high degree of confidence that expansion could take place with little cost, with little uh, ex expectation that commitments would be called upon, that we would have to, to live up to commitments that were being made. A whole series of rules were put in place for how we wanted the Euro-Atlantic world to function. And again, the assumption was is that these questions were settled. The Cold War is over. We can move forward to, to the next stage. What we now have is that the Ukraine crisis and the Greece crisis both call into question whether or not you can assume that all the rules are set and everyone is following them, and that there are costs. If you're going to enforce the rules on Ukraine, if you're going to enforce the rules on Greece, they're going to exact a cost, a political cost and an economic cost, particularly for the states of Europe, to some extent for the United States as well. And so countries have to then make a choice. If enforcing the rules is going to lead to a cost, do you take the cost of enforcing the rules? Or do you say that it's too expensive to enforce the rules? That the Greeks maybe shouldn't have gotten into the Euro area, but they did. But now that they're in, we have to bail them out no matter what because the costs of a Greek exit and the costs of imposing uh, Greek uh, compliance with those rules is too high. Or in the case of Russia and Ukraine, that yes, we had hoped that uh, territorial integrity of states was uh, was accepted, that we had accepted the, the Helsinki Accords, that there would be no forcible changes of borders in Europe. But if the costs of enforcing that on Russia are too high, uh, then do we have to accept uh, that uh, Russia has taken Crimea and that that more or less is a fait accompli and that Ukraine needs to be, uh, its status as a state needs to be adjusted whether it's territorial adjustments in the east or whether or not Ukraine's ability to make sovereign choices uh, for itself uh, in terms of who and what international institutions it wishes to ally with if those costs are too high versus, of course, the other argument, which is that if the costs may be high now, but if you don't enforce the rules, then you create uh, problems down the road. Uh, that if the Greeks have problems with the euro and you let the Greeks slide, then how many other states in Europe that uh, face economic troubles will may want to, to bend the rules? If uh, you have territorial adjustments in Ukraine today, then what about other territorial adjustments across, certainly across the former Soviet space? And now we've seen in other parts of Central Europe, uh, people that uh, have never, political movements that never accepted the boundaries as they were drawn whether or not we, we may see a, a separation in Bosnia. We have questions in Hungary uh, with the current leadership raising questions about uh, uh, the uh, durability of some of the territorial settlements. So if you let uh, the current situation continue, are you creating uh, problems down the road? And there's very much the sense that the countries of Europe and the United States have to make a choice about where they're willing to pay the costs, pay for enforcement today, or don't pay for enforcement today and then run the risk 
that these are not one-off situations and that you're opening the door to further problems in the European space. The second is that some of the assumptions made certainly in the early 2000s about strategies for coping with the expanded European zone of operations uh, are coming under challenge. Uh, a number of uh, people said essentially the European neighborhood policy is withering on the vine, the hope that Europe could be surrounded by a belt of states to the south and east that would be friendly and would also help to block problems from further afield uh, making their way to Europe so that you would have a strong belt of Mediterranean partners that would help to shield Europe from the south and that you would have the European neighborhood in the east that would integrate Russia more closely with Europe and would uh, bring Europe uh, uh, some degree of stability on its eastern frontiers that uh, these assumptions are now uh, under question. The European project itself is wobbling. If the British decide to leave the European Union, which was not something that a few years ago was a fringe position, uh, now it's going to be a referendum. It, it, of course, the British may not leave, but the very fact that we've reached this stage, that you have other people talking about renegotiating their position within the European Union, really raises the question of the durability of the European project. And then, of course, uh, the opinion polls released this past week uh, very disturbing about questions of solidarity in Europe when it comes to NATO, of populations saying that they're not in favor of necessarily living up to their Article 5 guarantee to their partners, that if a you know, uh, problem happens with Turkey and uh, with its neighbors uh, in the Middle East or the Baltic states have a problem with Russia, uh, that you have some European population saying Article 5 maybe isn't as definitive as we were led to, as, as people have been led to believe, and we might not necessarily want to uh, enforce that. So that raises some issues uh, for solidarity and cohesion in the future. Uh, the reality that Europe and the European space is faced with a spectrum of simultaneous problems. Uh, we do not have the luxury of being able to concentrate on one part of Europe and that the rest of Europe is more or less peaceful and stable. And, and again, as we traveled through Europe, the sense that there is a spectrum, a sliding spectrum of problems that range from the Arctic to the Baltic, to Ukraine itself, to the Black Sea, to what's happening in the Middle East, particularly with ISIS, uh, and then what's happening in Libya, the migrant crisis across the Mediterranean, instability further in Africa that is fueling pressures along southern, Europe's southern borders, and that Europe does not, and the United States, do not have the luxury of being able to pick one of these problems to focus on and then putting the others on the back burner. That there has to be a simultaneous response. But the reality is, is that without sufficient resources, you cannot have solutions for all of these problems. And so there's a certain degree of triage. Where are you going to hold the line and where are you going to try to, to solve the problem? Which problems take priority? And here you run up against the twin axes in Europe uh, that uh, run along an east-west and a north-south axis. That the further east you go, Russia is the bigger threat. The further west you go, Russia may be a problem, but it's not existential to European security. The further south you go, the Mediterranean problem is paramount, and this is the primary security issue. The further north you go, the Mediterranean is an irritant, but not necessarily a major crisis. And then, of course, the further north you go, it raises questions about the Arctic, the opening of the new sea lanes, uh, competition for energy resources, uh, competing territorial claims. The problem, of course, is that NATO and the European Union are both consensus organizations of their members. You can only get a policy through that all members agree upon. And so one of the things that you have, and this was one of the examples that continuously, particularly when we were in the commission in Brussels, is you have to have a policy that Spain and Poland can both agree on. And if Spain looks south and says the Mediterranean is the major security threat to Europe, and Poland looks east and says the major security threat is Russia, somehow those two countries, both in NATO and in the European Union, have to come to some degree of consensus. Some of it will be satisficing compromises. Some of it will be uh, papering over with diplomatic language in the hope that uh, 
Uh, you can avoid having commitments called upon. And then, of course, uh, Europe's last resort for security provision, which is the United States, which is the hope that the United States will fill in the gaps more. That if uh, Europe has to concentrate its resources in, in one area, that if the gap opens up, what can the United States do to, to uh, provide? Which, of course, then runs up against our increasing commitments in Asia and in the Middle East. What do we have available? What is there to spare to Europe? Also, the sense of solidarity. Uh, what are you prepared to do? Uh, so that, for example, the Baltic states, which are increasingly very concerned about Russian air and naval incursions in their own uh, waters and airspace, are reluctant to send naval assets to patrol the Mediterranean. But on the other hand, you have people in Italy and Spain and Greece who say, you know, an alliance is shared burdens. We support you in your burdens, you have to support us in ours. The question of refugee resettlement is one that is very uh, contentious because you have countries in the north and east saying, we don't want to accept our burden, our share of the burden of migrants coming across the Mediterranean. That's Greece's job, that's Italy's job, that's Spain's job. Particularly if you also, if you're in Poland or the Baltic states and you're worried about the possibility of migrants coming from Ukraine, that you may have to deal with and put a strain on your economy. So there is a strain now on the cohesiveness of the alliance. And one of the things that uh, we really walked away from is that there is a series of compromises that are going to, uh, that are in play, uh, that will have an impact on policy uh, that may not lead to the optimal strategic outcomes, but which are the ones which are politically uh, the ones that these institutions can support. Finally, we come back to the question, and I alluded to it already, what role is the U.S. going to play? This was something that uh, as we went through Europe and we traveled from east to west, uh, what is the U.S. role? How much is the U.S. going to come back to Europe? Uh, what's the future of your rebalance? Uh, what are you prepared to rebalance back to Europe? Uh, what are you doing in the Middle East? Uh, what, can we, what can we in Europe expect? Uh, some degree of, are you going to lead? Uh, or are you not going to lead? And if you're not going to lead, then do you need to move out of the way and let Europeans handle it? And perhaps, and this is something certainly we heard in Germany, if you want Germany to play more of this role vis-a-vis -vis Russia, the German solution may not be the one that Washington prefers. So is Washington going to outsource more to Berlin? and let the Germans uh, take the lead, and the Germans and the French have been doing that in the Minsk Accords. Uh, we were there, of course, when Secretary Kerry went to Sochi, and then uh, there was a great deal of disquiet with that, which is you weren't involved, saying to us, you, you, the United States, weren't that involved in this, and now suddenly you're sending an envoy. The Secretary of State is going to Sochi, and are you sending us mixed messages? Uh, the Secretary of State did, from what we heard, and the feedback we got uh, from people was that uh, his briefing in Antalya to the NATO allies helped to reassure people. Uh, but there's a sense of not knowing what the signals are from the United States, uh, what the United States is prepared to do, what Europe has to do on its own, uh, and uh, that will be an issue. Uh, and really this question in the end of uh, what's going to give. Uh, the defense strategic guidance from several years ago posited that the United States could rebalance, pivot to, to Asia a drawdown in the Middle East and slow the rate of defense expenditure in the United States based on an assumption that Europe would be quiet. Europe's not quiet anymore, so the Europeans now want to know what's going to give. Are you going to spend more? Are you going to not put as much in Asia? And then you've heard from our speakers already this morning, we have growing demands uh, both from our allies and others to, to have a more robust presence there. Uh, this strategy that uh, we've heard for the Middle East uh, if that doesn't work, is the U.S. going to be putting more in the, into that region if the local actors don't, uh, are not able to achieve? And uh, what can Europe depend on? And so I think uh, we have all of our panel today, all of what we've done, we've given you different parts of the world, but all of it comes back to these questions of uh, priority and where we're prepared uh, to make the investments and where we're prepared uh, to take the strategic risk. And with that, I'll close my comments. Thank you very much. Now we open the floor to Q&A. Please do use the microphones. Yes, sir.
good morning and thanks for an excellent uh, panel. Uh, Paul Daly from Boston. I think that uh, the panel and the earlier speakers have certainly set out a whole series of problems that maybe we should do something about, maybe we shouldn't. But in formulating that kind of a strategy, is there value in looking back at some of the things that we could have done in the last couple of years that would have drawn a line in the sand, set up a marker, or given our allies and our enemies some idea of what our strategy would be? Something like Syria when they used uh, uh, poison gas, or when uh, France uh, canceled the mistrial, you could have bought uh, maybe you still can uh, buy uh, those two ships as uh, strike, uh, strike ships for NATO. Or some of the things that we uh, could have done in the Middle East and some of the other countries, uh, for example, provide uh, lethal weapons in uh, uh, the Ukraine. So are there any things that we can learn, things that we should have done that didn't, we didn't do that would help in giving some guidance uh, for the future. Um, let me just uh, offer a couple of ideas. One is that, first of all, even though Asia Pacific is a long-term interest and we need to engage comprehensively in the coming decades, Asians and our Asian allies and partners understand that we have global interests and that they also are part of the same interconnected global world. They want to see effectiveness, though, and when they see ineffectiveness, fecklessness, tepid responses, ineffective responses, then they're worried in Asia, too, about the United States. So that's on one side of the ledger, and I'll let my colleagues here address things like the red line with Syria, because one of the flip side of, the, of had we acted in Syria more definitively, we might have inherited a Libya. Um, where we got rid of Gaddafi, but at the same time, we've got increasing encroachment on the part of uh, militant Islamists with no solution in sight. And that threatens Europe, by the way. Increasingly, they're going to be focused on that. So that engages all the regions there. Scarborough Shoal, though, in, in Asia specifically, had we responded more uh, sort of intelligently in 2012, we would have kept a presence and ensured that China did not directly benefit through tailored coercion, because right now they've benefited, and they've learned the lesson of what they call extended coercive diplomacy, that they've been able to coerce the ally of our ally. They've been able to coerce us to basically coerce the Philippines um, to essentially make gains through uh, assertive actions. I think we also have to understand, though, that the actions here are not just military. We need comprehensive power. So when I see things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership hanging in the balance right now, I, I, could, I don't care if we double the number of uh, ships in Asia Pacific. If I don't have more trade and business, we're not staying around Asia Pacific in the long term. We're going to be pulling back. So in addition to that, finally, investing in places like the Marianas. This is U.S. territory in Guam, for instance, prime real estate for amphibious and joint combined operational training throughout the region, building partnership capacity. Those are just some of the things that we could have done and should be doing uh, thinking about the future. Um, on, on the Middle East, the, the problem from, from the perspective of locals is that we either are too engaged or not engaged enough, right? So we either go to war and smash regimes like the one in Iraq or do nothing in Syria. But the, the upshot is that we did a lot in Iraq, and that's a, a country that's in ruins or in, in, a, Syria, in, serious, uh, in a serious mess. In Syria, we did nothing. It's also in a mess. And in Libya, we kind of went halfway. We did a little bit, but not too much, and not, and not nothing at all. And that's a country also in a mess. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's hard to draw you know, a policy recommendation, um, g given that you know, the whole region is a mess, regardless, almost regardless of what the US does. Um, and, and counterfactuals are very difficult. What I would like, though, the United States to do is um, A, to be clear in its own mind as to what is important and what is not, and then perhaps take a page from the Chinese and, uh, and take the kind of salami approach rather than either too, too being too engaged or not engaged at all. <laughs> 
Just briefly, the one thing I would recommend, and this comes out of my own observations of, of the Eurasian space, you have to take Putin, Vladimir Putin seriously. You have to take him at his word when he says things. Uh, he has been warning for years that Ukraine was a red line for Russia. He told President Bush in Bucharest, if you make a move to bring Ukraine into the Western sphere, Ukraine will cease to exist as a state. Uh, that, was, that was seven years ago. Um, and we had an approach where we kind of let the Ukrainians kind of took themselves out of out of contention in 2010 when Yanukovych was elected. Uh, but you know, if with a place like Ukraine, you either the West was going to make this commitment and do it, or it should have cut the deal with with Putin. But we're again, we're in this. We 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 either we're not we're not involved enough to make a difference to the Ukrainians, but we're involved enough to make life very difficult for Ukraine. Uh, and one of the things, again, from this trip that was worrying is that there's Ukraine fatigue uh, in Europe. There are no great donors. There's no Marshall Plan. There's no 1989 equivalents of what we did for Poland and the Czech Republic uh, for Ukraine. People are tired. They say we've spent money on Ukraine already. Uh, and, and so I, I, my worry is that uh, what we've done now is we've created a, a situation for a permanent frozen conflict there. Uh, that this will fester for years to come. Uh, of course, the Chinese are very happy. The Chinese are thrilled with what's happened in, uh, in Ukraine because it takes away attention from what they do, uh, lets the Russians test out the Western response about how effective it is. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, Beijing has been watching this very carefully and is drawing some of its own lessons. Uh, but, you know, we, we should have had a strategy for Ukraine one way or the other. We didn't. We reacted to it. We're continuing to react to it, um, and we're paying the price for that now of not having thought through the outcomes that we wanted, and for not, frankly, in my opinion, not having taken uh, Putin as seriously when he says that he's going to do something, whether it's Ukraine or the Eurasian Union or something else. Uh, um, we, we have to take uh, what he says and, and react accordingly, that he will try to do what he says that he's going to do. Questions? Yes, sir. I'm an old-fashioned writer. I recently completed a book about a Rhode Island pilot who was captured by the Japanese in 1944, brutalized, used for target practice, and beheaded. And during my research, I read about 1,500 pages of courtroom testimony from both Tokyo and Yokohama. My point is, recently, the Japanese prime minister declared there were no war criminals, Japanese war criminals in World War II. In fact, the seven Class A war criminals who were executed have all been enshrined. I got hold of a Japanese textbook, 10th grade. There's no mention made of the Bataan Death March. Uh, very little is said about any of the atrocities. Rape of Nanking was the blamed on some reluctant Chinese soldiers to uh, uh, surrender. And the Japanese, uh, the Korean comfort ladies were voluntary nymphomaniacs. It, my point is this, uh, Japan killed more than 30 million Chinese in World War II. They have never taken any responsibility do you think, I mean, we are, we are capable of pressuring some of our allies to do certain things. We don't seem to have good luck with the Japanese, at least as far as acknowledging what they did in World War II. Do you think this may contribute somewhat to the Chinese reluctance to work with the Japanese in any regard? Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, sir, thank you very much for your question. Obviously, history is extraordinarily important, and we um, forget it at our own peril, just as we forget about geography and other facts that really shape the reality of this region. Um, all my uncles have fought in all of our wars, but my, my uncle Bob was part of the invasion force of Okinawa. Um, and when I was re visiting recently Okinawa, I saw some pictures, in fact, of, of the force that he was, he was there invading, and I was with some Japanese school children who were at a shrine to some of the Japanese schoolgirls who were forced into the military because the uh, uh, Japanese Imperial Army wanted to make sure there's a war of attrition so that we could never get to the home islands. Um, it, this is impossible to overcome. We have to understand it. In fact, we have to push it out to historians to try to make sense out of it into civil society. Politicians should stay clear of, of, of shaping history. They should use history, learn history, but not shape it. You and I know that Prime Minister Abe, uh, his, <laughs> he's got a personal relationship that goes back to that question of who was a war criminal and who wasn't a war criminal. And um, once the war is over, it, it was still messy. I just hosted Governor Onaga of Okinawa, who is the newly elected governor of a place where we have the majority of our military bases, bases that are in our strategic interests, bases that are in the strategic interests of the stability of Asia Pacific. And he's opposed to our presence, frankly. He wants to stop the construction of the new runway at Hanoko. All I'm saying is it gets very complicated when you talk about current politics our national interests, and then trying to fix history at the same time. So yes, we ought to be reading Professor Payne's history of the Sino-Japanese War and conflict and have a bigger appreciation. The war didn't just begin with our World War II. It began long before then, it began with colonization. Those are all part of it. But the Japanese have also contributed since the end of that war to an incredible track record of building regional and global order. And I can contrast that to say Mao, if you read Tom Christensen's new book, and I invite you to read it, The China Challenge, he's got a very gripping historical review of how Mao Zedong um, had to face the choice of essentially ratifying Stalin's acceptance of the invasion of Korea, which would end up having a million Chinese casualties in that brief spirit, period of time, those Chinese volunteers, and, that, and Mao signed on to that never apologize for it. There's no even recognition inside China about that, not to mention Tiananmen, not to mention many other more recent historical episodes. I'm not forgiving the Japanese for the historical brutality. And I would visit uh, you know, the Canberra War Memorial, perhaps above all a museum, perhaps above all the museums in the world, I'm looking at Carl Thayer behind, is probably the best uh, historical representation in one place of the brutality of that war, to remember what happened. So, very important question. Yes, of course, it's part of the Chinese makeup. Yes, reconciliation should be part of it. But the Chinese uh, should not be forgiven for bad behavior today just because they were victims yesterday. Uh, I want to give some students a chance to, to ask some questions, and I'll come back to non-students in a moment. Students, where are you? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Captain Doug Howell, I'm a student in the senior course. Looking at the strategies of each of the three uh, contested arenas that you've discussed with us this morning, in your opinions, from the point of view of Moscow, Tehran, Beijing, what are those strategic, one or two items, what are those strategic concerns that keep them awake at night? Looking at our point of view, what about theirs? concerns that they have to adjust their strategies for that maybe their current strategy for would be concerned about? Sure. Uh, Moscow's got a lot of things that it has to worry about on its plate. Um, it is enjoying a resurgence now, but all of its long-term indicators are negative. Uh, it has partnerships of convenience with China uh, with other states, but no real strong alliances. Uh, and of course, the great Russian fear, what keeps them up and what they actually have conferences that are, are based on this. Their great fear is being cut out of, the, out of the international order. They realize that there's a point at which they could fall out of the position of being one of the world's great powers, uh, that they would be left behind. They were immensely worried 
when a few years ago Zbigniew Brzezinski was talking about the G2, it's the U.S. and China, and then maybe the U.S., China, and Europe, because that really doesn't have a place for, for Russia. So this idea of Russia being knocked out as one of the great powers and kind of condemned to being on the periphery, uh, not able to have a seat at the, at the table. And again, because when you look at what Putin defines an independent country, means that you can control your own domestic policy without any interference and you get to help set the agenda. Uh, you're an agenda setter rather than an agenda taker. And so from the, the what keeps the Russians up at night is that they're going to be forced to become agenda takers rather than agenda setters. Um, you know, for the Middle East, is actually a very easy question to answer. It's regime survival. And often, it's the survival of an individual that gets conflated with the regime, as you can see with President Assad in Syria today. I don't think these are regimes that are thinking strategically long term about the welfare of their own people. Well, first, China is different. There's a, they're brimming with confidence despite all the challenges. So when they think 1949, they don't think first current strategy form. That's what we were told. Uh, this was started in 1949. They think uh, the coming centennial in 2049 of the People's Republic of China, the realization of a fully reemerged, powerful China reclaiming its place in history. That dream is very important because it speaks to the nationalism that will forestall the failure of the Chinese Communist Party, or Xi Jinping hopes, because the economic growth rate, as I mentioned, is slowing down. The demographics are not favorable. In fact, the demographic bubble bursts earlier than many thought, probably 2020 rather than 2025. Um, and so they have to keep the economy going, very important, but they have to also feed the nationalism. And that nationalism has been fed pretty readily especially since 1995, and I just want to commend another book, Timing Chung's uh, research, um, Tom Mankin and others have contributed to, on the military modernization programs of China. We don't really focus on this. 1995, key period. The Taiwan Strait crisis, the bombing of the Belgrade uh, sort of Chinese embassy. Those dates created something called 995 Project. Um, 955 project, rather, and no, 995 project, which is the beginning of the real s strategic science and technology effort that started to bear fruition in the last decade, which gave them the greater capability to contest things like the East China Sea, the South China Sea, cyberspace, and anti-satellite weapons as well in outer space. And we're going to see more of that growing because that has to feed the nationalism. So that balance between the nationalist forces and keeping the economy going fast enough to survive with the Communist Party leadership or transition to something like it, that they still retain most control, that's what keeps, I think, Xi Jinping awake. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Cronin, um, you mentioned in your talk that one of the challenges with China was um, in information flow. What kind of information were you referring to? Yes, thank you very much. Um, we're doing a great deal of work on creating greater situational awareness in the Asia Pacific, maritime domain awareness, it might be called MDA. Um, it's information sharing. It's putting the region on CNN or C-SPAN, if you will, through leveraging the information age technology that exists. We've seen this already by commercial available satellite uh, imagery that has given us tremendous high definition, high resolution photographs of the seven reclamation island building projects of China in the South China Sea. Just in the past 18 months, China has more than doubled the landmass of the South China Sea. They're terraforming their way to control of the South China Sea, as my friend Alan DuPont has said in Australia. So they are, um, the world deserves to see that in real time. Um, we can share information, though, as well, for uh, dealing with the low common denominator that is the common interest that all countries have in responding to disasters and humanitarian assistance. We've been talking about it. We've been slowly building up capabilities. Well, we can create both a region-wide information-sharing network, something similar to the unclassified information fusion center at Changi in Singapore, for commonly agreed sort of shared information for everybody to use for disaster response, but we can also supplement that with allies and partners 
to focus on higher end uh, capabilities so we have better imagery and better early warning so that the Philippines, our ally, are not surprised as they were in 2012 when they found uh, the, the Chinese uh, armed maritime uh, law enforcement ships able to respond to their, the Philippine Navy ships, our former rusting uh, thin-hulled Coast Guard cutters that we, we sold them. Um, which are not, you know, were not really strong and not really meant to go up against the Chinese, and they suddenly found themselves. If they'd had better information awareness, they could have at least avoided that whole uh, fracas in the first place. Anyone on this side? Yes, sir, in the far back. Yep. Push the button. Sure, I'll just so briefly, and uh, I hope Carl Thayer will say more about that uh, on his panel tomorrow, if he has time. Um, the Philippines, when they were boosted out of the Scarborough Shoal, they were basically looked around and said, we've got no recourse now, but maybe a legal recourse. We don't have even a diplomatic recourse because the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the 10 Southeast Asian nations, are more of a talk shop based on consensus. If you think Europe and NATO is based on consensus, ASEAN, even if they have a consensus, that just means they put out a communique. There's no action that follows. Um, so um, Philippines can't even get the consensus on that issue. So they went to um, uh, an arbitral panel, which takes years to unfold, um, under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty uh, regime. And that uh, will on four points of law, including this question of what is the legal basis of the nine dash line claim, um, you know, for China, could embarrass the Chinese immensely if they come out in the first part of 2016 next year, about the time of, say, the Taiwan elections and just before the Philippine elections next year, um, that uh, the Chinese not wanting to play that legal game although they use lawfare all the time when it suits their interests, mostly claiming domestic law over these areas and that giving them the justification to send out their uh, marine law enforcement, maritime law enforcement ships. In this case, the island building can be seen as a preemption of the international legal process. So I think that's the short answer to your question is the Chinese are preempting this in part. That's not the only reason they're building these islands. They've long run, wanted the, a runway and now they're going to have the biggest runway. Um, they've long wanted to build up uh, Mischief Reef as well, and now they're going to be uh, building it up. So this is um, part, of that, part of that positioning game I talked about. They're using information, law, psychology, and all we're using is what? I mean, you know, we have to use more tools in the toolkit. With that, we are out of time. Please join me to thank the great panelists that we've had in this panel. Thank you.